All right, guys, well, let's start up again. Um, it's funny how in life, when you're teaching something or learning something, you start to recognize it everywhere. You start to see it everywhere. And I'm always on the lookout for examples that illustrate important concepts, especially ones that students often miss. And so I shouldn't tell you about this right now, because it'll be more important later, but I'm going to go ahead and tell it to you, because otherwise I'm going to forget. <laughs> I, uh, you guys know that I built that Tensegrity mailbox, and I've had a little trouble with it. I built a model of it, and it, it tended to topple over too easily, and I had to add weight to it to keep it from falling over. And yet, with all the high winds we've had over the last, you know, this crazy winter that's acted like it's spring, so you know what's going to happen in the Ohio Valley, right? Probably going to be 30 below in May or something. But anyway, um, with all this crazy weather we've had and high winds, uh, my mailbox has fallen over a couple times. I was really upset at that. I was like, man, this is not working out. I hoped it would work. And I realized what I needed to do, um, if I sketch the mailbox, let me let me show you something quickly. I'll just make a real quick sketch. You guys have seen it. So the, it goes into the ground back here. And there's essentially a, a hook that hangs up so that uh, the other portion that actually holds the mailbox can be suspended. That's that's the key to this thing, is that really the post in the ground is pulling up on the rest of this. Let me change the, there we go. Okay. Some, something like this. Okay, put that in the ground. Good enough. Okay, the key to this is that this holds it together. Obviously, if that was the only cable I had, it would just fall over. Wouldn't be very, so I've actually pulled out a T-beam, something that comes out this way, and then I've put a similar feature down here so that I've also got the cables on the back side. The problem is, you know, there's, there's cables front and back. The problem is that it still falls over too easy. So I literally put a screw in here and hung a big piece of, of steel that came from the railroad somewhere. I have no idea. Don't worry, I didn't go out and steal, take something off the railroad tracks to use on my mailbox. Literally, my brother-in-law works as a maintenance man at a large building, and uh, the railroad had redone the railroad and threw a three foot long piece of steel in their yard with about six inches sticking up out of the ground. He knew that the first thing that was going to happen was mower blades were going to hit that. And the steel was, you know, an inch thick, so it's going to destroy the mower blade. So he decided to dig it out of the ground and he said, yeah, I threw it over by the railroad tracks. You want it? They sure don't. So I took it and it was a perfect way. In fact, I cut it down to about 18 inches or so. The problem is it still fell over and, and the issue has to do with moments that we're talking about because the center of gravity of this arm with the mailbox and everything on it is about here. So the weight acting down on the mailbox is essentially here. Even though there's no material here, that's where the center of gravity is. And so this cable acts up and you can see why it would tend to rotate forward without these rear cables that also pull down. So really, you can sum the moment about this point or this point or any one you like and for equilibrium, the moment of all of these forces have to be equal. And so, anyway, it turns out that when the wind blows it, it can move far enough, or it could, so that the center of gravity ends up behind this cable, and then it's going to fall over. It's going to topple for sure. So it becomes unstable. So it's a fairly unstable design, um, although it is static when it's in its right position. And I realized what I needed to do. I needed to take this weight off, and I literally made one more improvement. I put a spike in the ground that had a ring on it. It had screw threads on it so you could screw it into the ground. And I just finished it last night. My daughter and I came home and I had bought the parts. I said, look, let's get this done so the mailbox stops falling over. And I, I hooked a cable between these two points. Okay. Now, what's the difference between that cable and the weight? I bet money it's not going to fall over now unless that cable breaks. In fact, I purposely sized the cable so that it could potentially break. It'll break at about 100 pounds. I mean, the cable was connected to the ground the way it was on the actual body. So that's true. That's true. Don't both just provide downward force, though? I'd say it wasn't the weight like a fixed force and the screw just a variable force. That's it, exactly. The screw is applying a force to this cable that is called a reaction force. And that reaction force is a reaction to whatever other forces are acting on this pusher, right? There's a certain amount of minimum force that's required just to, because I've got tension in the cables, right? But the main thing holding up the weight is this cable. So if wind comes along and pushes this, 
then this cable can actually increase its own force and pull down harder, which seems strange to us. At least it did to me when I was first thinking about statics because I didn't know what a reaction force is. I didn't realize that the floor will provide however much reaction force necessary, right? A lot of you guys are a lot skinnier than I am. Don't worry, you'll age and it'll catch up to you. <laughs> but the floor has to apply more reaction force to me than it does for you when I'm standing on the exact same spot, right? And some of you could come over and stand and the floor would apply just the right amount of force to keep you from falling down through the China right? or wherever you would end up going, right? Would you, like the center of the earth? I think, you'd, I think you'd oscillate back and forth, except <laughs> then there's hot magna, magma that's cooking you on the way even if it's not touching you. I don't know. <laughs> Lots of things to consider, but you, you see what I'm saying, right? Yeah. So there's the reaction for it can actually change its own magnitude. It's a reaction. Go ahead. So would that be cheating then? Cheating? I don't think so. It's still a cable. Still seems strange, doesn't it, that I have to take this thing that looks like it's floating and pull it down to the ground? I think visually it actually increases the effect a little bit. I kind of like it. I could only find green coated cable. I wanted coated cable because I don't want it to rust and look mm -hmm. bad. So I could only find green coating, and at least in the 16th inch wire diameter that I wanted. So won't that stop it from toppling over if the car hits it? That's why I sized this to only apply at maximum 100 pounds. This cable will break at 100 pounds. If the car hits it, I'm pretty sure more than 100 pounds is going to go into that cable and snap. But I don't think that the wind will be able to afford that uh, or apply that much force. I'd say if the wind is going to apply that much force, I think there's more things to worry about than just the mailbox. Probably. But <laughs> doing that, isn't that just defeat the purpose of why you've built the mailbox? That's what I agree with. <laughs> well, like I said, I think it still is a tensegrity sculpture. Mm -hmm. It's still tied down to the ground with a cable, not with a post. So, yeah. Anyway, my, my, what I want you to remember is that there are reaction forces, and those reaction forces react to externally applied loads, and they change their magnitude just in order to maintain static equilibrium, unless they're overcome, right? I mean, if you have a beam sticking out from a wall and you put too much weight on it, eventually it's going to break. The material's going to fail. But that's the subject of 211, strength materials. Yes? So how did you figure out the cable could only, like, how did you test it that it can only, it was like, well, it's a also a question for 211, strength of materials. I'll tell you a real quick version of it. Um, I'm going to tell you a lot of lies in this class. <laughs> what I mean by that is we assume, we make some assumptions, that things are rigid. In other words, they don't deflect. In reality, everything deflects. Even this floor that I'm standing on deflects a little bit in order to support me. Um, and so the cable, you can model it as a round rod, a thin round rod. And you can actually calculate a spring constant as if it was a spring to determine how far it stretches based on the load on it. Now, eventually, you reach what's called the ultimate strength of the material. Actually, you'll go through what's called the yield strength first. The, the metal will bend, or not bend in the sense that it bends, but it will elongate permanently and not go all the way back. But then eventually, if you just keep going, eventually you reach a point where it just breaks. And that's the ultimate strength. So how do you test it? Well, simply, you pull it apart and see what it does. I didn't have to do that. When you buy a cable, you can see what its load is rated for. And the math is pretty simple. It's literally just approximated as a, um, a cylinder. A thin cylinder. Does but that answer your question? Yeah. Wouldn't that rating just be a safety, though? I mean, like, you could probably it's possible. more than that. It's possible, yeah. Uh, there's more to the story. I had some really thin cable that was not 16th inch diameter. It was the next size down, so it was... It, was a 30, it wasn't a 32nd. It was a little more. It was halfway between this. It was like 364. 364th, I think, yeah. And I just had it. It happened to be coated. It actually came with the drill that I bought. And I'm not talking about a little drill. I'm talking about a, a drill, a real big drill. I'll tell you more about that one later. Let's we'll see if it ends up being a fiasco. I might just hide that one. But anyway, um, <laughs> some manuals came with that. And they were, they were connected by this cable together so they wouldn't be lost. It turned out the cable was about the right length. And there was enough of it. And I didn't need to hold the books together anymore because I wasn't mounting them on the machine. I was putting them on my bookshelf. So I recovered that cable, put it on. The wind immediately snapped that cable. And so that, and when I looked up the rating for that size cable, it's about 50 pounds or so, I think 49 pounds. And so I thought that about twice would be reasonable. So I may be wrong, the mailbox may be knocked over today. We'll find out. It's always going to be impressive that the mailbox is withstanding 100 pounds force being applied to it. You know, that'll be pretty impressive. And like you said, that's probably a minimum, right? In reality, the cable might take more weight than that. Did you put slack in your cable? 
is it taught? No, it is taught. It is taught because if it isn't, then these won't be taught as well. No. Anyway, so now let's continue with the topic that I need to get to in chapter 4. I uh, went and got a stick and didn't realize there were actually already two sitting here. Um, something a little bit odd about these. What would you call this? Yardstick. Would you? Or would you call this a yardstick? Call that a ruler. This is what? a different length. Meter stick. This one is a yardstick and this is a meter stick. This one measures 39 and 3 eighths or so, and, or 1 meter if you like on the back. So this one actually has metric dimensions on it. That's just incidental. I didn't notice that. I thought it was interesting. So what we're going to do is use this as a body and think about what happens and what the effects of moving a force on that body are. This is what we're interested in. Determine the effect of moving a force and find an equivalent force couple system for a system of forces and couples. So if we have several different forces, how do we relate those to the same effect? Or how can I say this? How can we find an equivalent system? Something that is different but has the same effect on the body. Okay, that's what we're really asking. Right. We'll come back to the reading quiz later. So whenever we are uh, doing this, what we're trying to say is, if I hold the stick out, that's why I said let's do it. I'm holding the stick. Why don't you push on that end? Okay, so about how many pounds did you apply? I don't know. Twice. Okay, maybe 10 pounds, something like that. Mm -hmm. Now if you choke up on the bat, so we'll let it go past, right? you can do the same thing, right? He's applying force and the effect back here didn't change. It felt about the same. I think he pushed a little harder the second time, but you know, there's got to be a good joke here where I do something like this, pretend I've been stabbed. <laughs> anyway, so we're interested in what happens, but there's a different thing that can happen. Somebody else, I need someone else's arm. So grab that end and hold it. Now, if I apply a force out here, does that feel the same? I'm going to try to apply the same force here. Okay. How do the two compare? These things the same or different? First one seemed more. I mean, they were pretty close, but it was more difficult to handle, wasn't it? And so, if I apply that here, let's do it this way. I don't want to borrow your calculator. If I do that, it might fall. Let's use this instead. Okay. So, see what that feels like. I could get it. Feel it. And what does that feel like? It's definitely easier when it's closer. Definitely easier, isn't it? So, the if I, have, if I want the same twisting effect, I've got to apply more load, don't I? Mm -hmm. Or maybe a load and a moment, right? So if I were to apply, let's say that I, gave, I had him hold it, put the, the thing close, I could also twist on it, right? And have the same effect of having load farther out on the stick, right? But exactly how do they relate and why would we care? Well. We're going to care quite a lot about problems like this, especially when you get to strength of materials, but also in this class, where there are several forces applied to, the, to a body. But what we really want to know is what's an equivalent force system at a different point, like at the, the base. Why would we care about that? Because even though the forces are all applied up here, if what we care about is whether or not these bolts fail, then we need to know the load of the bolts. In other words, what kind of loading do these forces cause at the bolts? Okay. And if we can move those forces to the bolts, then we could determine the loading. Okay. So that's what we're interested in. There's got to be some way to simplify all these diverse forces and moments into something simpler at a different point. Okay. So how will we do that? Well, I've already used the equation, unfortunately, an example problem. I didn't realize that I hadn't covered the the slides yet. But it turns out that we can obviously, we've played with force couples so far, right? So we can replace force couples with moments. We can add forces together to get a resultant force, right? And if you think about it, adding forces together makes a lot of sense because after all we can play tug of war. Let me let you three play tug of war. Okay. So as you apply different amounts of force, one of you could trick the other by immediately reversing their direction of force. <laughs> right? And there's all kinds of different force systems, but what's the net force on that throughout that whole exercise? Basically zero. Zero. Right? 
unless one was really strong and managed to win every time, right? But there's, all we have to do is add up the forces to see the effect on the body. So there's, <clears throat> there's ways to do it. Essentially, to get the net force, all we do is add all the forces together. But to get the moment, that's a little more tricky. And I, get, I pointed out the equation last time. So the net force, if we move the force from A to B, the result is the same, right? There's no change in it. Okay? So this is called a sliding vector. Notice that the force vector can slide along its line of action and have the exact same effect on the body. Okay, so that's a sliding force. Okay. Now, there's a distinction here between the external effect and the internal effect. What's meant by that? Well, if I take this meter stick, I need to go in front of the camera, and I pull on it, this way, the net effect on the net external effect is no force. If I now take this meter stick and reverse the direction of force, push it this way, still net force is zero. Right? I'm pushing inward. Okay? But think about it. What if the center was made out of, I don't know, rubber, right? And I do this to it, pulling it apart. It's going to stretch. There's going to be internal stresses in the material that are different than if I'm pushing it together. In fact, we call this compression and the other one tension. Okay? We'll learn more about that in 211. So we're not really interested in internal results in this class as much as external. So the external effect on the body is the same. The internal effect will depend on where the force is applied. However, if there is a moment of the force and we move it off of its line of action, we have affected the moment of that force. Does that make sense? And so if we want an equivalent effect to this force, we have to add a moment equal to the force times distance. Notice the force is still the same. Right? The magnitude of the force is still the same. And the amount that you've got to pull up on the stick is just the weight of the remote, if we're setting the remote on the end of the stick again. right? The amount he had to pull up on it, which was harder to notice because it's a fairly small thing, is the same regardless of where it is along it. But the amount he had to twist varied depending on how far out the force was looking. So it turns out, though, that the couple, the force times distance, is a free vector. It can be applied at any point on the body and have the exact same effect. Just like I was telling you last time about applying a moment to a tire at its center or at a lug nut. So basically what we're going to do is take this system of moments and forces, and we're going to calculate an equivalent moment so we'll take the moment of the forces first. Okay. We've got a moment of F2, a moment of F1. Okay. And then we can add all those moments together because they are free vectors. Add all the forces together to make an equivalent force vector. So that's how we're going to simplify these things. Okay. The equations that I pointed out to you last time are pretty much well, they're not pretty much. They are pretty important in this class, or in this chapter. And that is that the resultant vector is simply the sum of the forces for the force vector. But for the moment, the, the resultant moment is the sum of the independent moments, the ones that are true moments that are applied, plus the moment of all the forces. Okay? So I asked you to write this in your book. If you don't want to, that's okay. But you might write this in your notes if you didn't last time. But this equation breaks down into actual moments themselves, and this is moments of force. That's pretty important. I had a couple of people ask me about that after class. It's an important point. Often, the system that we're looking at that we want to simplify will lie in a two-dimensional plane. So you see this arm that supports the weight of two lights. Have you ever stood next to a traffic light? You know how tall they are? They look like they're maybe this big when you're sitting there. Like. But they're actually pretty doggone huge, right? They're not quite as tall as I am, but they're, they're pretty close. And especially if they've got you know, an extra, a fourth signal. So they're not light. They're fairly heavy in reality. And uh, they cause a significant moment back here. So why would we be interested in an equivalent system here versus the weights of the lights out here? Well, because we want to know if this coupling here is going to fail or not. 
got to be able to resist the moment and the force applied to it. The total force applied to it is simply the sum of the weight, but the moment is the moment of the two forces. Okay? Of course, we also have the weight of the beam itself to take into account. But. Now, so in a two-dimensional plane, we'll have a sum of forces in the x-direction, sum of forces in the y, and only a moment equation that's not really a vector because it's out of the plane in each case. Okay, so it's coming out normal to Yes, sir. Oh, I thought you were asking, asking a question. So in general, we can take a system of forces like this. We can simplify them down into a force and a moment, even if there's no moment applied. Notice those forces can, can generate a moment, right? So we can calculate what that effective moment is. Now, if it turns out that the resultant is perpendicular, the resultant force is perpendicular to the resultant moment, then we can actually get rid of this resultant moment too by moving the force out and giving it a moment arm. And this force alone on this body has the exact same effect as these three separate forces, at least externally to the body. The internal stresses inside of the body will be different, but the effect on the body otherwise will be the same. Now your book then goes and talks about three special cases. I'm not going to focus on those. You aren't responsible for those. You might want to read about them, but they are special cases that we may or may not come across. Anyway, we can always analyze these systems in the general case and get the correct result. So there's no point, in my opinion, in uh, looking at special cases. I do want to go through this concept quiz. The forces on the pole can be reduced to a single force and a single moment at what point? Well, if we add all the forces together, we'll get a resultant force. Does it matter where that resultant force acts on the body? Nope, doesn't make any difference. So we could put it at P, Q, R, S, take your pick, doesn't matter. And of course, understand that these vectors, we don't know exactly what direction they're in, but they can all have components in the X, Y, and Z direction. So they're just general force vectors. How about the moment? Well, the moment's a free vector and it can be moved around anyway, right? Now the magnitude of the moment may depend on where we want to take moments. Right? That may change, but we can, we can calculate an, an, a, a, um, an equivalent system at any point that we like. So the right answer is E. Consider two couples acting. Now what do we know about couples? Equal and opposite forces. So if there's two couples, that means there's two sets of forces that are equal and opposite. So with two couples, how much force would there be? How much total force would there be on the body? Okay, with one couple. Two. With zero, right? With two forces acting in the equal and opposite directions, well, they're going to cancel, right? They're, they're, the total force is zero. Add another couple, it's the same story, so resultant force will be zero. Okay? And be careful, there's a difference between a reaction and a resultant. A resultant is a sum of things, okay? Whereas a reaction is, as I described before, a reaction to externally applied forces. Consider two couples. Okay, the simplest possible equivalent system at any arbitrary point on the body will have what? Two couple moments. Do we have to have two couple moments? C. C. You just need one. One couple moment. Right? Because you would add the, the twisting effect of the two and have one couple moment. Okay. So C is the correct answer. All right. I think that the only other interesting thing, oh, these are interesting, yeah, attention quizzes. Here we go. For this force system right here, the equivalent system at P is what? Well, we need to calculate the resultant uh, of all the forces, right? 30 down, 30 up. Well, those two cancel. 40 to the right, then is the resultant force. So we need an answer with 40 to the right. Well, there's two answers, A and D. Between those two, which one do you think is correct? How many people vote for A? How many people vote for D? A few people? Okay, so why D? Because the left moment is negative 30 and the right one's plus 60. That's true, or you could say, I'm lazy, I'm inefficient, and so I'm gonna sum moments about this point. 
That way, neither one of these forces have any moment arm. This one doesn't anyway along the entire line, but it's easy to see that if I sum moments about this point, both of those forces have no moment arm because I'm through their lines of action. Have a one foot moment arm and a 30 pound force, and realize that we've got a counterclockwise, which is positive, 30 foot pound moment. See how you can sum moments about any point you like and still get the same result? Okay. Questions? You guys are doing good. Consider three couples acting on a body. Equivalent systems will be what at different points on the body? Three couples. How much is the resultant force? Zero. Zero. The resultant moment, how many couples do we need? One or one moment, essentially, right? Can we put that moment anywhere we like? So which answer is correct? It would be B, the same even when located. Not C, because C says zero when located. No, not necessarily. The three couples are general, so we can have a net moment, just no net force. But they will all be the same even when they're located. Okay. All right, I think there was a reading quiz at the beginning. Were there more questions at the end? No, that was it. So let's just see if we can answer these now. In fact, wait a second, didn't I already go through these? No. no. Okay. All right. A general system of forces and couple moments acting on a rigid body can redu be reduced to a what? So in general, we have forces and couples. None of them are zero. Obviously, the couples don't add anything to the force. Right? And we reduce these to a single force in every case? No, because remember we said sometimes when the resultant force and moment are perpendicular to one another, then we can get rid of the moment. We can offset the force, get rid of the moment. But in general, that's not possible. So a single force doesn't make sense. A single moment? Not necessarily, because remember, these are general systems of forces. So we're going to have some force as well. So I don't think it's B. How about C? No, because we can simply add the two moments together. So D is the correct answer because we can have a single force and a single moment in general. Okay. The original force and couple system and an equivalent force couple system have the same what effect on a body? Remember internal is talking about what's going on inside of the body, whereas external talks about the no overall net effect on the body as if the body were rigid. This is not really a fair question, I think, because you haven't learned about stress and, and uh, how stress is generated within a body. That's, as I said, the subject of 211, strength of materials. So the answer is not A, internal microscopic. We haven't talked about anything microscopic. So it's either internal and external or external, and the answer is actually external. Because, like I said with the ruler, when I try to compress it, that's a different thing internally than when I try to pull it apart. Okay? All right, any questions on all of this? I would go through an example problem, but I already went through the example problem I was supposed to go through after all of that. So hopefully the last example problem will work for you. I think it was at the end of last class makes a little more sense now. Last slide deck from chapter four. I really like the way these slides are laid out in the sense that they often give us motivation for what we're learning. Why are we interested in what we're learning? Now, you've probably all been to Lowe's, Home Depot, Menards, places like that, and you've seen cantilevered beams supporting uh, you know, racks of, of wood. There's a proper name for it. I can't remember what it is. I think it's in the slides. So if you were trying to design this bracket and decide whether or not it would fail if it's big enough, you need to know what the load is from the wood, but that load is actually distributed because this is a fairly wide thing. Notice that when we talk about forces, there are forces, but on the other hand, there's kind of not. Because if I apply a load, let's say, to this book, so I'm going to hold up the book, put my hand on it, let's just pretend the book's down lower and I'm resting my, my body on this, this uh, book, okay? So I'm leaning and, and resting on it. Certainly the book applies a certain amount of force, but in reality, there are force sensors, or I should say pressure sensors, that are area pressure sensors you can lay down. And you can actually measure the pressure at different points. And what you'd find is there's a whole lot more pressure here than out here, which kind of makes sense. You should try it sometime, lean on it, and just see where the pressure is the highest. And the force is actually the integral of all that pressure. 
So force is more something we make up, even in the sense of gravity. I mean, certainly there's attraction between the center of mass of my body and the center of mass of the Earth, right? <coughs> but really what's going on is every particle within me is attracted to every particle in the Earth. And oh, by the way, every particle of the Earth is attracted to every particle within the Earth as well as to all the particles in my body and yours and so forth. But the net effect of all that is a, a force through a point, right? So in reality, everything is kind of like this. There's a lot of distributed loads to consider. Often we can neglect that. We can just talk about, you know, if I'm leaning on something, talk about the force in my arm, right? As long as the force is not too great, my arm won't break, which I hope it never is. <laughs> but anyway, so is there some effective force that does the same thing to the beam that this distributed load does so that we can use that force to calculate what's going on back at the base. Well, actually, that's what today's topic is all about, or at least this section. Oh, it's called a bunk. That's right. So that's a bunk of 2 by 4s And it certainly does uh, spread out its load along the length. Now, what do you think is worse? Is the wood out here worse than this, or is the wood back here worse than this? What do you think? What does your intuition say? Stuff further away is causing more of a problem, isn't it? And, and you know that because you know that the further out you put a load, the harder it is to resist the moment of that load, right? The same thing that's going on here. So how do we analyze it? What would we do? Well, notice that this is a lot like what we were talking about in the last slide deck. We're looking at multiple forces, or in this case, a distributed force, and what's an equivalent load to that distributed force? Okay? So how would we do this? Well, this is another application where we're interested in um, a distributed load like a wind load along a flag or some type of, I don't know, must be some uh, rigid flag, but whatever it is. So we'd have to know this in order to design the joint between the two and keep it from coming off. I think a better example might be the joint from a wind turbine blade to the hub. Right? What's the effect of the wind pushing on that blade? Because certainly part of it that we want is the moment that tends to turn the turbine, right? But another part of it is tending to try and break the blade off, right? That's part of it. So we need to be able to calculate that and determine its magnitude so that we can uh, design the wind turbine appropriately. Anyway, so there's many situations where we have a distributed load along the length of the beam or a surface, and these are often caused by things that are distributed, like, for example, you know, gravel sitting in the bottom of a rail car, for example, or maybe um, uh, if you put your hand out the window as you're going down the road, right, and all the fluid pressure on your hand pushes your whole arm back. What's that net force? The way we'll analyze this is by taking a differential amount of force, because force is just the integral of pressure over area, or another way to say that is if I have you know, a hydraulic cylinder that has a piston in it, and that piston has, let's say, two square inches of area, and the hydraulic cylinder is at 500 PSI, how much force is on the cylinder? Well, two square inches times 500 PSI comes out to 1,000 pounds of force. That's why hydraulic machines are so, we usually call them powerful, but in reality, they're very forceful. They're very strong in the sense that they apply a lot of force. I don't care how much you're of a bodybuilder you are, you're not going to equal a hydraulic cylinder. <laughs> Right? at least with any decent hydraulic pressure behind it. So what we're going to do is analyze this distribution as if it was a lot of little bitty forces along the length. Now, at first that may seem a little bit confusing, so let me break it down for you just a little bit farther. Let's say that we have a beam. And we're applying a distributed load that is 10 pounds per foot. And let's say the length of the beam is, let's make the math easy, 10 foot long. What's the total load on it? It's just 100, just 100 pounds, right? 10 pounds per foot, got 10 feet total. Easy, 10 times 10 is 100. Now what if instead we have the same 10 pound per foot load for 5 foot, 
But over here we've got, despite my drawing, 20 pounds per foot for the other five feet. Now how much load's on it? 150. 150. This is simple, right? Not hard. We could keep breaking this down farther and farther into fractions that are different heights. It doesn't matter how the distributed load goes. Right? And, and so on and so forth. Make these smaller and smaller. Keep finding equivalent forces over these small areas. And eventually, this would become, in sort of a calculus sense, could become a smooth distributed load. Mm -hmm. That's all we're doing here. Okay? That's all we're doing. That, that's the whole idea here. And so, don't worry, if you haven't had calculus and you don't, don't know what this DF means, it's a, a small amount, small amount of force over a small amount of area or applied to a very small amount of area. In calculus, what you do is you allow that, that D, that differential amount, to go to zero and you do something called integrating. What that really means is that you add up a whole bunch of them. In fact, you add up an infinite number of them to find out the total. Okay? So how are you going to add? Well, I guess calculus just takes a long time, right? <laughs> No, actually, there's ways to do it in a reasonable amount of time, but that's what calculus does. It adds up an infinite number of things. That's what integration is all about. Of course, derivatives are also a topic of calculus, and derivatives and integrals are actually opposites of one another. But you'll learn all about that. Anyway, so notice that the distributed load, W, is a function of position now, right? We've got different amounts of distributed load depending on exactly where along the beam we look. But its units are force per length, regardless, okay? even though it varies. Now, this is a little bit calculusy, so I've got to go back to my uh, example at the board that I drew for you, where we have small amounts of force that are different amounts set side by side. But for how many? I'm curious. How many of you have had calculus? Have some Does five years count? Okay. Five years ago. Five years. Ago. It still counts. Yeah, you can understand. That. I don't remember nothing. So, okay, good. I didn't realize you guys had, had calculus for the most part, so I don't have to go quite so slowly. And if I'm going too fast, please do slow me down. So the differential amount of force that's being applied would just be equal to the distributed load times the distance. We're doing the same thing we did at the board when I said 10 pounds per foot times 10 feet. But now the 10 feet has gone down to a small amount of feet, right? And that's then a small amount of force. So this is the distributed load at that point, in other words, as a function of x, times the amount of width that we want to take, and we'll get from it a differential amount of force. So if we're interested in a resultant force that is a resultant of this entire distribution, then it turns out we can simplify things. The net force on the beam is simply the integral of all this force. So we just add up all these smaller forces along the length of the beam. And so if we're adding them all up, we have an equation for df. It's just the distributed load times dx. And it'll turn out that this will simply be the area of the geometry. Now don't panic, we're going to deal with very simple geometries. We won't actually do any integration in this, well, can't promise we won't do any integration in this class, but I don't think we're going to integrate here, at least not yet. And so we're going to deal with just, it'll be on the next slide, we're going to deal with triangles and flat lines. That'll make our lives a lot easier, okay? When you get to strength of materials, then we'll, second, maybe later on the course we do a little bit more, but anyway. So what we need is the area under the loading curve, Wx. That's what we really need. So it turns out that if we integrate this, it's simply this area. Okay? Where, obviously, the, the height represents the weight per length as we go along. Okay. By the way, that's what integration does. It just adds up area. The location of the resultant will actually be very easy to calculate as well, especially in this class, because think about it. Each of these little bits of force will have a moment arm x. And so the moment of this little bit of force about O will simply be the distance x times the force df. And so if we want the total moment of each of these little forces, if we can think about it that way, all we have to do is integrate x df, so the length times the small amount of force, but that df is simply w of x dx. It's just the distributed load as a function of x times the differential length dx. Now, we can press the easy button because it turns out, oh, that's not yet. 
I'll tell you in just a second. So if the resultant force acts at some position x bar, then it'll have a moment about O equal to x bar times f bar. And what we're going to do is set that equal to this moment. Okay? So all we have to do then is multiply x bar times this integral. And that is the moment of the entire distributed load. Okay? Now if we compare those last two equations, let me show you what the last two equations are. It's uh, these two. Right? Both are MRO, so these two are also equal to each other. If we compare the two, we can solve for x bar. All we have to do is write this equation over this equation, this integral over this integral. However, where is it? There we go. Fortunately, it turns out that's just the centroid of the area. So if we know this area, and we know where its centroid is, then we know where the resultant of that area is. Okay. And we can calculate the magnitude of the resultant FR by simply calculating the area. So this is not as hard as it looks. The derivation is a little harder than the, the actual work itself. So this equation might look a little bit intimidating, but it's more the idea of the equation than anything that you need. Okay. And I'll show you how to use this in the context of example problems. I think that's uh, the bulk of these slides. By the way, I do not go through the um, examples in the textbook, and I don't go through the examples in the slides, I'll leave those for you to go through. That's one good way to prepare for an exam in this class, is to go through those things and, and re review them. Okay? Questions, comments so far? Okay. So I'm going